Minerva Tantoco. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of New York City, the first ever Chief Technology Officer of New York City. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> and on, on behalf of our feminist mayor, Bill de Blasio, I am very, very happy and honored to welcome you all to tonight's um, Data Bootcamp panel. And uh, I just want to make a few remarks and then introduce this uh, amazing panel. First of all, how incredibly amazing it is to see this event happening here in New York. I can't tell you enough uh, of how important it is to have more women involved in technology and in particular involved with data science. I myself, uh, I've been a chief technology officer for 17 years. I started a software company 30 years ago um, and pretty much was the only girl in the room for the most part. <laughs> and it, I'm really, really thrilled to see things start to turn around. It's extremely important for women to participate in the innovation economy, in the tech economy. Um, from the perspective of technology, we have so many unfilled technology jobs, and that's what's gonna make New York City and the United States more competitive in, in the economy of the next century. And if we're not even tapping half of our population, we're gonna fall behind. This is a big, um, <clears throat> uh, this is a very important uh, priority for our administration and for, for, for all of us in the room. And I'm just so heartened and thrilled to see an event that is really targeted towards girls and women getting involved in data science. When, when I speak to um, you know a lot of students, they ask me, what are the things that I should be studying? I said, there's just two things, and you, uh, you will never have to worry for a job, data science and cybersecurity. Those are the two things, and you'll be you'll be um, employed for life. So, you know, uh, I, I do think that the creation of this chief technology officer role is a um, recognition not only of the importance of technology to New York City government, but also the importance of technology to New York City's future. We're very very focused on closing the tech divide in uh, New York City, both. From a, from, for, uh, sorry, both from a gender divide perspective, income divide, racial divide. We think that technology will provide opportunities for all New Yorkers. It's a pathway to the middle class. Um, we're working on providing broadband and internet access for all New Yorkers, computer science education in New York City. And uh, we're, I'm happy to say that we're actually, um, <clears throat> you know, pra practicing what we preach. Uh, Mayor de Blasio's administration is the first uh, mayoral administration which has uh, the most number of women leaders in, in his uh, leadership. 53% of senior leaders in New York City government are women. Thank you, Mayor Bill. <laughs> and, um, and the two leaders of New York technology our women, that's me, um, you know, the chief technology officer, our chief information officer, the commissioner of department of IT is Ann Roast. Um, and so we like to say, just keep calm and let the women run the technology. <laughs> so I'm very, very pleased and honored. And, and again, on behalf of New York City, on behalf of the mayor, it's incredibly inspiring to be in this room with you all and to introduce this illustrious staff. I feel I am not worthy. <laughs> um, we have uh, this evening Ellen Stofen, NASA's chief scientist. You can clap. <laughs> we have Katie Coleman, astronaut. Now that's, that's a cool title, I have to say, even cooler than mine. <laughs> and then we have Beth Beck, NASA's Open Innovation Manager. So without any further ado, I'll let you go on with the show. Thank you. All right, um, some of you have been here before, and those of you, if you've been on the live stream, you were with us all day. Um, and so we have new people coming in. You can't hear it. Hello. It's on. Um, 
maybe with the air coming. Anyway, we're going to do a quick introductions, and then we have some questions from that we've been collecting from Twitter and social media for the last week or so, and then we can take questions from you guys, too. So just a quick introduction. Um, I work for Deborah Diaz, who's right there, who is the Chief Technology Officer for IT. <laughs> She would be here, but she'd rather be there. Uh, so I'm going to moderate and kind of answer some questions to you. But I do open innovation at NASA. And if you think about it, all the data that comes down from every mission that Ellen does and that Katie does, that, that's data that we can make available for you. So if you think about it, our open data is like we've collected because our mission is to explore and to discover. But once we get that that data back, then for the open data program, which Jason Dooley and I work on, and he's over on the side, uh, our job is to set it free so that you can have it. So for space apps, the International Space Apps Challenge, which is why we're here this weekend, uh, we have, it's one of our open innovation incubator programs, so we can take our data and we can give it to you, because one of our mandates is to spur innovation through our data. So the best way to do that is to create a, a program where we can wrap the data in context. So it, we already know the context of our data, but to give new context in the form of challenges and to bring people around it and, and you can create new solutions to this and give us new insights. So just to let you know, we have 136 locations this year. It's the largest one ever. We have over 10,000 people that have already signed up. We're in 62 countries. And I want to give a great shout out to the, um, the Space Apps local hosts. So for New York, they're the ones putting this show on. We gave the data. We wrapped it in the challenges. We're here to, to enjoy this. But they're the ones that did all the hard work to put this in place. And it's happening all over the planet. The people are coming together. So one more thing about that. It's so awesome to me that NASA, the seeds of NASA data, we keep harvesting in so many new ways. Um, last year, 671 solutions from the challenges that we had. So NASA data is now taking new life in these new ways that we would have never done. It's because you guys have new ways of applying it, and you can apply it to the way you live your life. Um, so we're so thrilled to be part of the fact that you want to take part in our data. It's this really wonderful kind of relationship where we're feeding on each other in a way, where you inspire us and we're thrilled to see that you're inspired by what we do. It's just this wonderful community that we're creating. So we're, we're thrilled to be here. Well, my name's Katie Coleman. I'm one of the astronauts. I've uh, had the privilege of flying twice on the space shuttle and then once this last time on the space station. So I lived there for six months and you know, we're, we're here as a team, as part of the NASA team, but in the hopes of becoming more of a NASA community, really, with, I mean, when you see the data, you realize that it's all about the Earth. You know, I mean, there's a lot about space, but it's all about what happens down here, and we're here to relate some of our experiences so that you're basically better informed or understand our point of view a little bit, so that you can then look at it from your point of view, which we're really looking forward to. You know, we, we gather so much data at NASA, and it is publicly available to everybody, but our frustration is, how do we get it in the hands of everybody? And we can't do that on our own, so we need help. And so the International Space Apps Challenge is one of my favorite things that we do every year because it's harnessing talent that we normally don't have access to. It's bringing everybody on with our mission, which we think is really fun and trying to share that, trying to say space, space exploration is for everybody. It's about protecting our home planet. It's about harnessing our power to, to release a lot of the research we're doing up on the International Space Station for everybody. It's getting you involved with our asteroid challenges. You know, most of us remember the Chelyabinsk event where that, that rock exploded over Siberia and broke all those windows. You know, asteroids are a threat to this planet. And so bringing you guys in to help us understand that, help us communicate that information, it's really about teamwork. Um, and when we work at NASA, when we try to do something like land the Curiosity rover on Mars, or do successful work up on the International Space Station, it's all about harnessing the talent that each person brings to a problem. And so I was so excited to see so many girls here today. Um, I'm so excited that hopefully a lot of you are going to be participating this weekend. We're harnessing talent all around the globe. So all of you are part of this global event that I think is just tremendously exciting. So thank you for being here.
logistics. Oh, this is a loud one, so I'll hand, we'll trade. Okay, so we have gathered many questions from the world. So we'll start with Katie. How do you stay in touch with family and friends while you're on a mission in space? And I'll trade with you. So we actually have an internet protocol phone up there. I mean, so norm normally we're talking to the ground all the time. We have, we have communication most of every hour. Sometimes we'll have 20 minute gaps or small gaps, but we've got calm a lot um, with the ground, with mission control. But then if we want to talk to our friends and family, it is literally like picking up a phone and it's as private as any cell phone call is, which I don't think they really are. <laughs> Hi. Um, anyways, um, but it's, uh, you know, and so you can call, it's a little bit funny because there's a sort of a delay, and, uh, and I learned to just sort of blurt it out, you know, hi, it's Katie Coleman calling from the International Space Station, like if it was somebody I didn't know, and, uh, and, <laughs> and a really nice guy one time um, who's an author um, said, oh, thanks, can you hold on just a minute? Okay, so I will have fries with that, and... <laughs> But it's a great way to stay in touch. I talk to my family every day except for three out of the 159 that I was up there. And that was really meaningful to me. Quick follow up on that one. I, I had to, I love the Sandra Bullock story. So while she was in space, um, gravity hadn't been filmed yet. Uh, do you have anything you want to share with your, the research that Sandra Bullock did while you were on space? It, so my younger brother actually met her brother-in-law just by chance down here. And he said, well, you know, my sister-in-law's making this movie, and it's about space, and maybe your sister would talk to her. And he said, well, my sister would talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and I think she would talk to Sandra Bullock. And it was a great morale thing for our whole crew because the, the guys were like, oh, we, there's, we have only you. You have Sandra Bullock? How come? <laughs> And we would try to have conferences together, but it's actually very hard. You, often you, you're calling and you know, nobody's answering the phone. It was hard to find each other. But she just had questions about what it felt like to live up there and what it was physically like to move up there. And then you know, that movie, to me, any movie, anything that lets people understand that we're doing some really special things in the space program. I mean, there is a space station going around the Earth 16 times a day, six, six people are up there, um, they're probably just going to bed. They're probably supposed to go to bed a few hours ago, they're probably just going to bed. And, and it's real, it's, to me that's so amazing. You can look up on the web and say, when will I see the space station? And you can look out at the right time, the right direction, and you know, kind of the right angle, and you'll just see the star, it's the, like the brightest star, and it won't be there, won't be there, won't be there, and then suddenly it appears, because it's suddenly lit by the sun at the right angle, and then it's just gonna come across the sky, and it thrills me to see that, to know that, oh, my friends are up there, and, and this is what they're doing, it's magic that we are able to do this. So it was really great, I think, that a movie like uh, Gravity and others make our reality real to a greater amount of the population. And I also liked it that they had a woman heroine who, you know, was really tough and determined. And when things didn't work this way, that way, or the other way, thought of a new way to make them work. So it was fun. Problem solving, that's what it's all about. Ellen, so how do individuals get involved with citizen science and especially in the younger ages? You know, I always maintain that any project we design for citizen science, probably somebody in fifth grade can do it better than somebody my age um, who's maybe a little more challenged. In fact, um, we have this great program called Disk Detective where you classify stars um, as to whether or not they're likely to have dust disks. And it turns out the human eye does it a lot better than a computer algorithm can. And so um, the guy who developed it, um, they have a little training software so you can figure out how to use it on the web and I was totally stressed about it. I'm like, what if I do this wrong? And he's like, Ellen, calm down, just, <laughs> just give it a try. Um, but I would say any kid can do it. You know, these problems that we have, uh, um, I think most kids are really talented. Right now we have a website called, um, it's at nasa.gov slash solve, I think is the, um, NASA yeah, NASA solve is where all our citizen science one of the things we've been trying to do over the last year is trying to gather all that information on citizen science and ways that people can participate in NASA activities into one place. The next thing we're trying to do is to say, how can we expand these programs? How can we get 
even more projects where we can get even more people involved. And again, a lot of it is because we have so much data. There's so much need for our data to be utilized more than it is, especially our earth science data. You know, climate change is, is really, in my mind, really the crisis of all of our generation that we're facing. And NASA gathers an awful lot of data that be, can, can be used in really practical ways, and you see that on some of the space apps challenges for this weekend. So, um, you know, I would say people can definitely go to our NASA Solve website, um, and, and I think kids of all ages, um, from kids in their 60s um, to kids who might just be 10 or 11 or 12, can find something um, to join in on. And also Gladys Henderson, right up front. Woohoo! She is our NASA Solve Challenge Prizes person. So as I mentioned earlier in the day, talk to Gladys if you want to know how to get engaged with our challenges because we have prizes that actually have money attached. Some of them. Big bucks, some of them. So that's where you can find it. All right. Back to Katie. I'm going to give you a... I'm not sure if this is a softball or not, but um, what's an April Fool's trick like in space? Oh, you know, this is where you have to be careful because like what you think, I mean, you're so, it sounds funny, but you're so far away, right? And communication gap. And so you just, um, you have to be pretty careful about what you do because it might not be funny on the ground, right? But it wasn't April Fool's, but we actually just could not help ourselves when uh, Robonaut was delivered to the space station. And it was just, it, it's, he's this amazing robot that is helping us understand the interface. He, I, I would say, I, I always said she, in fact, I gave Robonaut a pink shirt, bright pink shirt, <laughs> when we were training. And uh, we just, it, it's this amazing robot that helps us understand how, how we interact with robots, you know, on an assembly line um, to make cars, or, you know, in an operating room, or on a space station, where we're hoping that they could do some work that we'd like them to do. And he was a, it was a really big deal when, we call him he now, he just, he's, he's He's kind of he looking. We, we should fix that, but anyways. Um, but we, when he arrived, he arrived in a crate the size of a refrigerator. And there was just a big to-do about his unveiling. And we were very excited as well, so we actually unpacked him. We were instructed very carefully to film all the unpacking and everything, ha and we were supposed to do it at a certain time on live TV. And so we were so excited we did it the night before. And we unpacked him. So on the day when we opened, and, we, and then we screwed in all 32 of those little bolts on that refrigerator-sized box. And on the day that we unpacked him, we opened it up, and there was nobody there. <laughs> you can tell I'm still slightly proud. <laughs> and uh, I think we were told that we shouldn't give up our day jobs for acting. But then it turns out that Robonaut was actually already up and around controlling the space station from a computer. It was very fun. So Ellen, what is your favorite iconic NASA image? Oh, that's a, that's a tough one. You know, we're celebrating this year the 25th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, for many of you in this room, there hasn't been a time in your lives when there has not been a Hubble Space Telescope. Um, Hubble has done so much more than it was ever imagined to do. First of all, it was it was um, serviced how many times by astronauts? Four times by astronauts from um, um, from the shuttle each time, um, and it, it has changed our understanding of the universe, of galaxies, of the nature of stars, of star formation, and probably my favorite image is the most iconic image, I'm sure you've, you've seen it, it's called the Pillars of Creation, um, which has these uh, galactic dust clouds um, in, that are um, basically star nurseries, it's where a whole region um, where uh, stars are forming. Um, and, and to me, so many of the um, images that we get back from Hubble, they look more like art than they do like something you might want to go do science on. And, and so to me, Hubble is also this amazing intersection between just aesthetic beauty um, and science that I absolutely love. Love that too. I, I love all the Hubble. Uh, we have an Earth as Art program at NASA, and it goes in and takes all those beautiful images and, and lets them be art. And actually, sorry, my little space apps side stories, but last year, yes, and but last year the, um, I can't remember the name of the app, but one of the, from Kansas City, that was the name of the app? So Earth is Art, okay. Um, and out of Kansas City, created an app that took all the images, and you could go in and decide whether you want a night image or a day in image, and you could pick your satellite, and then you could write it 
a note on it like, oh, it's the day that I had my first child or something like that. Really, really cute. And so they won in Kansas City, one of the finalists um, for the global. So yeah. love our okay, point of view. I have to break in here because we've heard Hubble, 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 Hubble. <laughs> station, right? station, human space. Well, so. and so, you know, having been part of the team that launched the Chandra X-ray Observatory, <laughs> You know, the poor Hubble, you know, it goes around the Earth very close. And so it actually has its view blocked a lot of the time. And so Chandra is in a 80,000 kilometer orbit, big elliptical orbit around. And so it's only out of, um, I think, 60 hours, only for five of those 60 hours is the view blocked. But everything... <laughs> Well, you know, I'm teasing about the, the, the competition, but um, it's a, there's a family of telescopes, which to me really speaks to me, where they look at all the different energies of light, and together that makes one image. And what I, I love is that there's, you know, they'll understand now where something is going to happen. And then we point all these telescopes in the same direction and collect data in all the different energy levels. And there'll be one picture that looks really boring from one te telescope and is amazingly complicated from another. And Chandra um, fills in the gaps when it comes to black holes and a lot of energetic kind of uh, events. But back to Hubble. <laughs> Oh, I like the Hubble too. No, I, but you know, I went to the Hubble 3D um, movie years ago when it first came out, and they let NASA, you know, people come see the screening of it. And what shocked me, I mean, because you see pictures, but the movie it shows here's a picture, and then it zooms in, and then it zooms in, and it zooms in, and it zooms in. And number one, I was going, oh my gosh, we really are a blue planet because it just keeps zooming and zooming and zooming in the black of space. And then it talks about, you know, the the uh, Apollo program and how they said on the way to the moon we discovered the earth and that really back to the point of view it really um, a lot of work for NASA but it was one of those we just don't think about how we, the vast universe and I really like what you were saying even with the Kepler it's looking at just a little sliver so there's all this other that we don't know so call your congressman but no you didn't hear that from me <laughs> just kidding just kidding we're happy with what we have okay so um, Man, was that, that was Ellen and back to, oh, so back to Katie. <laughs> you can go to either. I know, well, back to <laughs> So here, is there a lock on the bathroom in space? <laughs> <laughs> so there's no lock, but actually, um, it's not the first time I've had that question. And I think that there, when people are deciding, is that, you know, is, is that thing, is being an astronaut or being someone who codes or being someone who's an engineer, is that for me? And often there's really misconceptions. And one of the misconceptions about going to space is that you're going to have to give up your privacy and, it's all, and all those things that you think might be tricky are just going to be awful, like going to the bathroom, right? It is easier than on any camping trip I have ever been on, okay? Or in any, you know, place that you've been just yesterday arriving. New York City. Um, but, you know, so it's easy to do those things. There's lots of privacy. Um, it, it, and it's actually a really big place, our space station. It's like eight train cars all put together without the seats. It's just some of them are up or down, but it's very big. And often you're the only one in that module. There's plenty of privacy to change your clothes, to do everything you need to do. And, and it's all very easy with no gravity. What I'm going to do is ask both of you a question, and but I want, while they're answering, we want to take a break from the internet questions, and if you guys have a question, so be prepared, and do we have an additional, oh, you do, Good. thank you. So the question for both of you is, what is the major barrier to getting to Mars? And you talked about it a little bit earlier, but... Well, I'm going to assume Katie might take on some of the human health challenges. So. Um, the one of the <laughs> no no I'm gonna give Katie some. Um, one of the chief challenges to getting to Mars is actually getting onto Mars. Um, we we can do rockets that can get. We're building a new rocket called the Space Launch System um, that is going to be able to throw astronauts further. That will get them um, the energy levels they need to to move onto Mars. Um, we still haven't built yet a. Mars transfer vehicle that would carry humans from, say, the vicinity of the moon to Mars. But that's not a huge che technological challenge. We just, we just need to do it. The real challenge is landing on the surface of Mars. Um, and that is because Mars, while it's about the, a third the size of the Earth, um, so it doesn't have as much gravity as the Earth, but it still has a fair amount. What it has is a very, very thin atmosphere. And atmospheres are really great for slowing spacecraft down. 
Um, some of you might have seen our seven minutes of terror video that the Jet Propulsion Laboratory did for the Curiosity landing. Um, it was seven minutes from the top of the atmosphere until they had to slow themselves down to essentially zero because you don't want your spacecraft to crash on the ground, even if it's just got a rover on it, let alone people. Um, so how you slow a spacecraft down, Curiosity did it through a complex um, combination of some retro rocket firing parachutes, actually a series of parachutes, then this crazy thing called a sky crane that basically let it down on, on cables, really complicated. Beforehand, frankly, a lot of us were really worried it wasn't going to work. It worked um, perfectly. The Curiosity rover weighed one metric ton. We estimate that the amount of material you're going to need for humans on the surface of Mars, so that's somewhere for them to live, supplies, a rocket to bring them back to the Earth, launch them off Mars to get back to the Earth. <laughs> that's on the order of 40 metric tons. We don't know how to do more than one metric ton. So what we call entry, descent, and landing, or EDL, because we love acronyms at NASA. Um, so EDL is our top challenge, I would say, uh, for Mars. So we've been talking about Mars for a while, you know, here in, in the time that I've been growing up, and it's a long way away. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a long distance, and it's, it's one thing to say, let's just go, and there's the practical aspect that Ellen talked about, but then there's also a bunch of other practical aspects, and, and an analogy would be when the family says, and I think they make movies about this, when, like Chevy Chase and those guys where they go, let's go camping, and they're envisioning, there we are with the family, the tent, frying, you know, neat food that we all love, but the reality is you got to think about what you need to bring, and what's the weather going to be like, and how do you bring enough of it, and will it all fit in the car, the car packing alone, right? I mean, I'm, being, I'm being kind of funny about it, but the reason we haven't gone to Mars yet with humans is that we are not ready, and that the steps to get ready are, they're methodical, they're logical, we need life support, we need to be able to filter the air in a very repeatable, dependable manner, take out the CO2, we need to recycle our, our air and our water, um, we need to understand what's going to happen to the people so that when we get there, we still have the bones and muscles that we need to build what we want to build on Mars. Our, our environmental uh, system on the space station breaks every week or two or three. It broke today. And, and I mean, that's, it's not horrible in that we, we're NASA, we always have a backup. We have, we have several copies of it and we have different ones and we understand what's going on with it and we're figuring it out. It doesn't break because bad engineers designed it. I mean, it might have probably not broken as, broken as soon if women engineers were designing it. More women, right? But, but it, I mean, it breaks because we, don't under, we didn't understand the microgravity environment because we need to learn about those things. The toilet breaks all the time. We need a really reliable toilet. But these are just, I mean, and it's not sexy in terms of like, let's just go. I mean, that, just going, that's sexy. But the reality is a lot of really good, solid, engineering and problem solving, solving logical problems to do each step at a time. And I'm hoping that we're gonna make some headway on a few of them this weekend at Space Apps. Uh, one question about radiation. So that's the other piece that we, you know, we're uh, getting out that far. Do you wanna talk about that? Because that's a yeah. huge deal for humans and for other species. It is here on the surface of the Earth. We're actually protected by largely from um, solar radiation and cosmic radiation by the Earth's magnetic field. It's like a bubble around the Earth. And so when, for example, if there's a big solar flare or coronal mass ejection, these explosions that take place on the surface of the sun, they send reams of energetic particles towards the Earth. Most of those divert around the Earth because of our magnetic field. Once we send astronauts out beyond that, I mean, they're getting a little more radiation up on the International Space Station, just like you get a little more when you're on an airplane as opposed to the surface of the Earth. But when you're at the moon, on your way to Mars, you're getting a much higher dose of radiation. You're getting a lot of cosmic radiation, and we worry about that in particular because that's really high energy. So you're getting these higher energy particles, they come in, um, and basically the result of it is, is that it raises your lifetime cancer risk. So what we've been doing over the last um, many years at NASA is doing an awful lot of studies on radiation exposure. This is also a great example of how the research we do in space actually benefits us here on the Earth. Because if we're trying to think about ways to protect astronauts 
um, especially more sensitive parts of astronauts that are more likely to, to have higher cancer risk, um, organs, um, fatty tissues, things like that. If we're worrying about that, we also worry about that here on Earth. For example, when people get radiotherapy, when they um, have cancer here on Earth, you want to make sure you're attacking the cancer and protecting the rest of the person. So in working on this problem for astronauts, we're actually also doing research that's very complementary to a lot of our needs here on Earth. Um, so a huge amount of research going into how do we protect astronauts, um, what effect does shielding have, how much shielding do we have to bring, um, what are better types of shielding. Um, and right now, the conclusion we've come to is that the radiation is not a showstopper. Um, we will in likely be asking astronauts to take on um, a higher risk of cancer than, say, even somebody working in a nuclear power plant here on the surface of the Earth. Um, but we're doing a lot of research to say, how can, we, how can we minimize that and minimize the effects in the long run? And so it's a similar story for osteoporosis. You know, it, our, our risk of that is um, accelerated up there by about a factor of 10. Compared to a 70-year-old woman who has osteoporosis, we lose bone and muscle 10 times faster. So what she would lose in a, in a, a year, I would lose in a month, approximately. And yet, the things that we learn, because it happens so quickly to us, it also makes it easier to measure and to map. And so to understand the mechanism, and we often have, we're often maybe even chosen for our very sort of clean medical histories that make it easier to draw some of those conclusions. But that, a lot of that research comes right back down here to Earth and to you know our society where we need to protect everybody's health. And it's exercise, is a big. It's true. I tell it. people that you know yeah. there's good news and bad news. You know, and, and they're both the same. The good news is we have something we can do, and the bad news is exercise is here to stay. Like weight bearing exercise, so that that really does make a difference. All right, so any questions from the audience? Oh, good, good. Practicing her speaking skills. Hello. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, it's really loud. Okay. I have a question for Katie. What do you miss the most about being in space? Ooh, it's a very, very special. Place. And, I, and I miss actually just being in this place where I, I felt like a colonist. I mean, I felt so special and so privileged to be in this place, to have this viewpoint and have the view of the Earth. And, and every single thing that you do every day reminds you that you are not on Earth. And, and most of all, I loved the flying from place to place. I'm not, you've, a bunch of you have been with me all day, I'm not that graceful down here. And just, you know, with a touch of a finger, you are flying from place to place. You can actually see a video that Karen Nyberg did on the web that shows that, I mean, all it takes to move is, you know, one hair from your head, you can hold it between two fingers or t two hands, like Donald Floss or something, and just use it to push, and you will move yourself across the space station. So it's like living the life of Peter Pan, and all the rules are different. And it's just a magical place to be. Hi, uh, this question is for Ellen. Um, how would you, um, or what would you suggest for someone who is trying to really push for more research in a field that is uh, somewhat limited, um, and if out there bought a, bought by companies that are currently within that field are bought by giants like Google and so forth. How do you push for independent uh, research in lar within large organizations? You, you know, I, I think that's a great question because I, I think the importance of innovative ideas and different approaches and saying, you know, here's something that I'm really passionate about and, and it's, it's an area that needs to have be nurtured. Um, and I think the most important thing is to bring your passion to it because, you know, when, when people want to advocate for something or, you know, when people come to me or they come to Charlie Bolden, the administrator of NASA, and it's something they really care about, what you look for in somebody is to say, do they have real passion and conviction about, about what they're doing? Can they tell a story about why it's important, why it needs to be continued? Um, and I, I think those two things, having a good story and having the passion, is how to continue research in an area because if you can demonstrate to people like look this is really critical and here's a story of why it's important or how it affects i started um over the last several years we've really been working on nasa at science communication and you think 
don't you guys do that all the time? But I think one of the things about communication that we often forget to do is to tell a story. Um, and so when I think about how to talk about Hubble or how to talk about why I think it's important for humans to go to Mars or why we have astronauts up on the International Space Station, it's bringing that passion to the story. It's saying, I believe in this. It's really important and it's cool. And here's why, here's a story about how it should matter to you also. And so all of those things I think are important elements, but keep, keep doing what you're doing. There's a question over here. I think you should lecture them about telling stories for Space, cha for space Apps Challenge. I would lecture them, yes. So uh, it is, I love doing that. My kids don't like it. Um, so telling, the storytelling is exactly what we've been talking about um, all day. And we want you to, again, if you have a great idea but you can't tell a story, find someone who can help you tell the story. So that's the other thing about when you're teaming tomorrow and the next day, it's like you need the designers and the coders and the, um, the crafters and the storytellers. So, um, and you know the storytellers. You can tell who they are. So just have them come to your team and, and help. At, even from the very beginning when you craft it, you should be storyboarding your, your idea anyway. I think it should do this, I will do this, here's why we need it, but the whole so what factor, um, that's the big, if you can't say so what, why should I care? If you can't say it, then people won't get it. So that's my little lecture on that. But yes, the storytelling is, is just, and I'm so glad that everyone's. It'll help you win. If you tell stories, you're more likely to okay, win. Okay, and I will tell you. Because understand it. Exactly. So that, so as our, as our judges know, uh, our, our executive judges, there are several in the room. Um, it's that video, the 30 second video, that makes all the difference. Now the rest of us on the team, we go through and look at your GitHub and see what you've done and make sure that you're legit and that you really have done some work and all that. But it's that 30 second video, it makes all the difference. And even get to, to get to the top 25, I have to tell you, make us laugh. I, it makes all the difference in the world. When, when NASA people are sitting in a room laughing because it's just the this most clever, hilarious, then you kind of go, it may not even be the best solution, but oh my gosh, that's hilarious. So it at least moves forward a little bit. So yeah, telling the story, you can be super serious, but you know. All right, so enough of my lecture. Oh, no, Ellen's got more. You know, I was just going to say, one of the things I think when you do tell a story, and one of the things is, I think a lot of times you forget to start at the beginning, um, and you're so enmeshed in a problem, you know, and I, like, I study volcanoes on Venus, and like if I started talking, I, I would start at chapter four, because that's where my head is. And I have to realize, and this helps me, my, my daughter, I'm gonna embarrass her, my daughter over here, um, who's 19, she's studying Russian and politics, so she's not a science person. None of my kids are. I took them on way too many geology field trips when they were kids and lectured them by rock outcrops, and they were like, no, okay, I've had enough of this. Um, but I think when I tell a story, I'm gonna think about telling it to one of my kids. I'm gonna tell it to my husband who has no idea what I'm talking about. And I think that's the other part. When you're thinking about your storytelling, remember the people you're talking to aren't, aren't with you. You need to bring them with you from <laughs> the beginning. Not in chapter four. Yeah, yeah. I, I really like that. So one of our guys on our Chandra mission was a guy named Dr. Steve Hawley, who's really a great storyteller. He's, he's actually quite a quiet person. He doesn't really like talk like me all the time, right? And I would say, well, Steve, you know, what about these white dwarf things? You know, I, don't, I don't understand this. He goes, well, it turns out. And then the story would come. And he makes it be alive, which I really need someone to tell me stories like that. I think Ellen's a good storyteller, because every time she talks about rocks, I'm going, I want that one. I want that rock. <laughs> so, uh, Olivia, I know you had a question. Um, before you had talked about how, um, oh, God, everyone's looking at me. Um, <laughs> Before you had talked about how astronauts would be a lot healthier if they were able to like exercise and like eat right, um, is there some kind of like limitation when it comes to zero gravity and like being able to exercise? And if there are, can you explain some of them? Um, there's not. I remember when you were saying that it's like a little. It was implying that it was hard to do. Um, we actually do exercise about um, hour, an hour and a half. It's about a two hour period, but an hour and a half, about an hour of weight bearing exercise and 30 minutes of cardio. And we do that, I would say five days a week, maybe six or, or more. And if you don't do it, we actually uh, sort of lose our, our 
um, muscle so much more quickly, then you just don't even feel good if you don't exercise. Plus, hundreds of people know whether you did or not, and that's always very motivating. Um, but it, so, it, so it's definitely possible, and at the same time we're doing research, it takes a lot of time. You know, six crew members, two hours a day, I mean, it's just, it's a lot of time out of your day, two hours a day, and there's still, you know, other time, brush, teeth brushing and all that kind of stuff. So we've been doing some experiments to understand how to do it more efficiently, and yet you also have to think about the human part of it. You know, if you do more interval training, um, you know, then that's, that's more intense, and can we m maintain the same amount of bone? And also trying to look at different kinds of exercise equipment, and also people are people. Like, you know, I, I hated the exercise bike. I mean, I just never wanted to do that. And yet, some people loved it. But if it turns out, so you can't actually just give one answer to human beings, really, although there may be room, only room for one option. So you have to figure out a way to make a good technical solution that the humans can live with. Right now, we're doing okay, but we still have a lot of research to do. I want to add a quick story about the, because I work with a lot of astronauts who so love hearing their stories about things, but Doug Wheelock, his, he's got the best story. He was here last year, but when he came back from his mission, you know, we talk about exercise and the things they do, and they have exercise equipment, but he was talking about how he didn't realize how much work it took to hold his head up, and he's a big guy. And so when he came back to Earth, it's like he couldn't hold his head up, and so all those muscles, and I had never thought about the weight of a head, and you know he is a—he's a big guy. And I think Carl, I'm um, blanking out. There's, Carlos. yeah, Carlos. He came back and he had, he had to go through therapy forever for his back because all the exercises you do, it was—he wasn't doing, either he wasn't doing them in a way that he strengthened the back muscles, but it took him a while to get those muscles back. So it's just interesting. Different people, even with the same exercise equipment may, we need the trainer right there, you know, spotting you and making sure. Our, yeah. our, train, our trainers watch us, not all the time, but we have sessions with them as, as often as you would want. And, uh, and that's really helpful to have them look at your form and, and things like that. And actually between those two crew members, Carl was on expedition two. I think, and Doug was expedition probably 24. And so in that iteration, we have uh, gotten an exercise machine up there that seems to be actually preserving people's bone and muscle mass very, very well. Yeah, and, and just to, though, to follow up on that, again, what we're learning up there is, is certainly helping us and it helps to us, inform us down here because those of us who work in very sedentary um, desk jobs, um, while we lose bone density much slower than astronauts do, it turns out a lot of um, like um, pounding and weight-bearing exercise you do are what helps keep our bones strong here on Earth also. And so again, we're always reflecting back what are we learning on the ISS and how can we use that to keep us healthier here on this planet. Um, with the weight training, how do you, like in that environment, how do you like avoid people getting injured? Well, we're just um, careful, I think. Uh, we, you know, we think about the, the hazards before we go. We actually make sure the payloads are safe. There's a lot of testing that they go through to make sure that they're not going to suddenly snap open and slap you or pinch your fingers or, you know, those, those kinds of things. And so it, um, I would say it's, in general, a pretty safe environment. I mean, um, one of the things we think about is, is actually banging your head because you're flying, right? <laughs> And, and so we're, we're careful, we're careful about uh, those things. Yeah, now, now expand that to going to Mars because you can say, okay, you're going to go to Mars, you're going to land on the surface, there's a lot more hazards, things could happen. And so some of the work we're doing on the International Space Station right now is, you know, simple stuff. What, what, um, what pharmaceutical products would we need to take with us? How do you keep them shelf stable? Um, which, you know, most, most drugs on the earth after a year, they're no longer stable. How do we work on that issue to keep them stable for like three years? What kind of training do we need to give to the astronauts to help them diagnose? You'd certainly want to have a doctor along in case you needed some minor medical procedure. We can get at the astronauts home really quickly from the International Space Station. We couldn't do that from Mars. Yeah, and, we, and we won't necessarily have a doctor on a mission. And so what are the things, you know, what can you do that, you, what can you be coached to do? And what are the things that we need to be able to train people to do no matter what by themselves with no one else to help them? Um, we have procedures, there's videos. It's, it's interesting, the, the communication and the storytelling that then uh, helps us understand how to take care of ourselves. 
have time for one more question? I feel lucky. <laughs> so I'm actually crazy enough to actually read those journals you were talking about earlier today, though, when people post them. And I actually been watching footage of spacewalks. And my question is, I actually witnessed a spacewalk where somebody was having to fix some sort of module. And they literally said, I can't see the color. The part is black. So they didn't know which way to rotate the wrench. So my question was, is this due to the color? I mean, I know the part was black. But is the visor also tinted on a spacewalk? Um, it's got a gold shield on it, but I don't think that... It doesn't really mess with I, color. I don't think so, and I think it would probably had more to do with lighting. Mm. And something that's, you know, we, we, doing spacewalks is expensive. It's more dangerous. Mm -hmm. And it would be nice if we had a robot out there doing our work out there and that we only had to go out for things that you really needed a human hand or human, you know, eyes to do. And so um, I work in the office of the chief technologist. Something that we're looking at is, you know, how do little flying robots see? And how do they see in that environment where it's not like here we are, it's in that very bright where everything is either white or black in the really stark light. How can they see in that limited environment? I was talking about a color sensor earlier, so I was thinking that's not going to work out in space. <laughs> so, yeah, but I mean, I was thinking of that very problem, so thanks. By the way, we have three challenges about robots and one of them is the sensor yourself and it's so all three have that or with the little spheres robot um, so if you're interested in that look at that and I did want to also say bring it back to data real quick and spacewalks um, last year was it last year we had a spacesuit fill up with water and it turns out in the mishap report as we do it turns out it was a data issue and so our office has taken on working with this spacewalking office in Houston to figure out how to have the data talk to each other because you've got data on contracts, you've got data. We, the International Space Station has 16 countries, so we've got Russian spacesuits and, and American spacesuits. So the fact that data not talking to each other could put an astronaut's life at risk is this kind of shocking. You'd think it's a malfunction part or there was a hole in it, or there was a leak, or you know, some valve didn't work, but that it was the data. So bringing it back to data, all of these challenges, you know, we're giving you data, we're giving you challenges. You, you might come up with some really awesome way to make the, the spheres robot see um, colors when it's really black and white, and we hadn't really thought about that. So I'm really, I'm excited that you guys are here. You know, we're so thrilled to be part of this. Um, thank you so much, Katie and Ellen and Minerva for starting this off. And um, we, I believe we have food outside are coming in here soon. This has been an awesome day. Thank you all of you for coming and, for just, and, and Sandy for coming and speak. So thank you for being here and I hope you're all taking part in the weekend which is kicking off and if you're not, you can do it virtually even if you hadn't signed up for it. So thank you guys.